Looking back in the 2010s, there's not that many styles of horror that I really enjoyed compared to the prior decade. It's only recently that survival horror started to pick up the slack in terms of both style and substance in the AAA space. However, it's a completely different narrative when looking at the indie scene. Thriving success by offering unique and avant-garde experiences, as well as more familiar ones that retread old ground in different ways. Many and interesting titles have cropped out during these last 10 years, all garnering a relative amount of popularity through general word of mouth online and let's plays showcasing the pan shitting terror these games have to offer. One game in particular has always stuck out to me more than any other house of jump scares. A game that I consider to be a hidden horror gem of a game. Ladies and gentlemen, Devil May Far Cry. I've always felt alone. My whole life. For as long as I can remember. I don't know if I like it. Or if I'm just used to it. But I do know this. Being lonely does things to you. Feeling shit, bitter and angry all the time just... You play as Simon, who is by all accounts an alpha demon who's run away from his hometown to journey off into the city. After turning into roadkill, you wake up in a den and alley with miraculously no bruises in sight. You go rummaging around the street and start seeing some spook spicious shit along the way. You get jumped by some mad lad with a hammer in the back rooms and partake in some awkward melee combat, and then travel deeper into the streets until reaching a seemingly abandoned apartment complex. You're obviously not alone after all the shit you've seen outside. The hallways seem to drag on for a while and you start to get lost, entering tight wet juicy room after tight wet juicy room. You catch wind of something sinister going on as you get jumped by rotting childlike monsters wrapped in garbage bags and afterwards find notes of a pedophile serial killer and even visiting his little private art gallery. And it's around this point where the game gets, uh... It gets fucking loud. Jump scares in horror games are forever a touchy subject. On one hand, it's a very effective method of getting your blood rushing and tensing up straight to your cock when you're catched off guard or when it's followed by a suspenseful buildup. And on the other hand, it's a very much cheap and easy way to spook a spec, but the feel can fade away very quickly or become an annoyance when it's used often. I personally don't think jump scares are a flat out and valid way of scaring someone in horror, as long as it's used appropriately. However, Cry of Fear seems to be an exception to the rule on the basis that it's personally how I believe a first person horror game should be done, always forcing you to fight rather than fly. The gameplay loop is trad thought survival horror, rife with resource management, inventory fuckery, varied arsenal, preset saves, and boring backtracking segments dropped in the middle of the game to pad out the length. Gunplay itself feels a lot like CS 1.6. Encounters are usually short, tense, and always in close range. All simple stuff, as long as you remember to reload when your clip is fully empty, as you'll be throwing away countless bullets that the game never tells you about. And even with the edgy memes and ear-piercing wailing, the game can still be effectively scary through the little subtlety it has. The streets of unnamed Scandinavian town are completely suffocated in a cold and empty winter night that never sees the light of day. For me, it evoked an extreme sense of both desolation and comfort as I slowly walked through these maze-like streets, taking it all in. This cold-hearted ambience is married to an unsurprisingly heavy, oppressive atmosphere like no other. The howling wind can be heard both indoors and out, and it's a small detail that goes lengths in unnerving the player. This can also be said for other bits in the sound design, using amateur techniques like reverb, distortion, and even pause stretching, giving work vibes to that which cannot be seen. It's also not a surprise that the OST has some prevalent Yamaoka vibes covering both ranges of ominous and dissonant synths and samples that slowly instill a sense of apprehension, as well as the louder Oh Shit tracks having that near identical relentless industrial percussion that's synonymous with early Silent Hill.
has a number of more calmer tracks that play over segments of downtime, using a variety of carpenter sounding rudimentary synths and airy droning strings to create a smotheringly bleak and melancholic soundtrack. brief periods you get to hear a few tracks feature some short and somber guitar instrumentation, which are low-key beautiful in its simplicity. Visually, the game isn't that much of a looker. The lo-fi look of Gold Source is an acquired taste that I happen to fancy, and I even think improves the game in a surreal way. Looking past the city background reveals everything past it shrouded in an abysmal darkness, an ingenious and time-effective way of map designing that's fitting for such a game. But of course, not all is well in Not Silent Hill. The game can be a buggy and inconsistent motherfucker at times, leading to genuine sexual frustration. There's a potential for it to suddenly crash when going through a door, both music and sound effects forget to play, guns can straight up get jammed unintentionally, certain jump scare prompts forget to trigger, and key items can just clip to the floor if you drop it briefly to manage your inventory, essentially soft locking your game if you save before realizing. <coughs> For <coughs> as much well deserved shit they get, I still enjoyed the monster designs in this game despite their cliche, edgy appearance. Standouts in particular would be the screeching dolls, the on-brand ghost girls that drive you to suicide, Mike Myers the hedgehog, and the re-deads with a grilled spurt. Also, did I mention just how fucking loud they all are? The enemy AI in this game is unmistakably the epitome of rubber bending. You have no room to breathe as enemies will come rushing towards you the second you spawn in a room and try to pin you against the nearest wall. Seeing these fuckers rush towards you jittering at the speed of fucking sound never fails to scare the shit out of me, especially when engulfed in pitch darkness. <laughs> Several hours in, you finally manage to get a ride back home by boarding a train. You're already lulled into a sense of safety when the game pulls a rug under you and you're left to fend for yourself in the woods with all your items gone. You're permanently on edge as you inch your way through the trees following the faint glow of the lanterns like a fluorescent breadcrumb trail. That is until you reach a vast and empty region of the woods and you start to hear a chainsaw revving up. An all too familiar sound at this point in the game. A wooden board with a spray painted arrow pointing forward lies under a small, <coughs> detached doorknob. You pick it up and keep walking forward until you hear Mr. Chainsaw screaming right down your neck. And it was at this point, led into the game, that Cry of Fear made me its bitch. In fact, the sole reason why I haven't covered this game earlier was because this game ended up spiking my anxiety, which was already a very real issue last October. So in my infinite galaxy brain wisdom, I made it a ritual of playing this game from 12 to 3 a.m. with all the lights off, the volume up, and the doors and windows wide open. I was fully immersed in this game's horror, to the point where I needed to take constant smoke breaks to calm myself down. Even employing bitch tactics where I put on my headphones off-centered so I couldn't hear the whole thing. I could physically feel my gut dropping every time I had to go through a long, dimly lit hallway or a pitch black open area, inching my way to the exit and always hyper aware of my surroundings. I was shitting bricks every time I heard an avocado drop next to my house and paralyzed in fear whenever the wind slammed the door shut. <laughs> and the best part of it all being that I truly fucking loved every second of it. On paper, Cry of Fear is a predictable and severely flawed game when directly compared to the big dick elephant in the room it's inspired by. 
From a technical anal POV, the game is unforgivably brutal with its difficulty and some backwards design choices, on top of it already being a buggy mess. Everything relegated to the story is handled so poorly and laughably that it just comes off as childish, going far below a baby's first Silent Hill 2 ripoff. Themes of mental illness, suicidal ideation, rape, and murder are once again played for nothing else but shock schlock instead of any sort of character building, like in every other horror story in a cesspool of literally billions. What it lacks in its themes, however, is far more stronger in its unique atmosphere and horror, always building up more and more tension and rarely letting go, as its abrasive approach to horror keeps tightening its grip on you. Games and movies of this genre never fail to make me feel a range of predictable emotions, but rarely do I ever get to feel chills and spills like with Cry of Fear. At its best, it's a true gem in a landfill of jump scare fests and bloated hide and seek marathons. And at its worst, it's an adorably edgy, low budget haunted house ride that I still urge everyone to try out even if it's not their thing. So go check it out before Halloween is over. It's free on Steam so you kikes won't have to worry about shit.